Diego as well. The latest batch of nationals that we would like come home and have actually gotten an exemption to come home happens to be in Venezuela. Now they've gotten the clearance. However, the problem is that Venezuela's airspaces are closed when it comes to this novel coronavirus and this pandemic. So although these nationals here in Trinidad, uh, out in Venezuela who are from Trinidad and Tobago can return home, They've contracted an airplane, but the airplane won't be able to leave Venezuelan airspace. It will require government intervention. Speaking on their behalf this morning, uh, Member for St. Augustine, I've got Prakash Ramada, also attorney at law, over the phone. Mr. Ramada, good morning to you. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Trudan Tobago. Good morning, Raya. Thank you very much for joining us. So uh, you've sent a letter uh, yesterday to the government of Trinidad and Tobago asking them to intervene because it will now require the government to write to the Venezuelan government to allow this airplane to leave Venezuelan airspace bound for Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, in fact, uh, that letter went yesterday, but this was preceded last week um, when I wrote to the Minister of Foreign Affairs asking in a general term as to whether he has done anything or the ministry to coordinate with other governments, other diplomatic missions, because we were seeing that they were repatriating flights back to Trinidad and into the Caribbean. And I didn't want the embarrassment of planes coming into Trinidad empty when we had citizens who are suffering terribly in foreign countries wishing to return home. And I thought that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the least that they could do, is to coordinate with our citizens to assist them in bringing them home. Of course, I put two questions before the Parliament on the same issue. Those questions were refused by, uh, by the Parliament. Uh, and I was then later communicated with by that group from Venezuela through one of their representatives here. And I penned that letter because it is a simple thing for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to look after the interests. In fact, it is their duty to look after the interests of um, our citizens wherever they are. And the from a document received from Rutaka Airways, they are indicating is that a letter from our government um, should must be sent to the Venezuelan authorities before they can give the, uh, the permission for that flight to leave to return home. Are you encountering red tape in getting this communication done between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela? A little less than red tape in that we've had no response. So to my letters from last week and not to my letter from yesterday, and that is why I'm grateful that this is being highlighted, because this is no longer a matter of bureaucracy. This is a matter of inhumanity. Um, these persons in Venezuela and many others, I'm dealing with students in India, persons in the United Kingdom, students in the United States, Canada, um, the Caribbean, who are literally at their end in terms of their resources and in, and in terms of the emotional and mental stresses created on them. Matters that could be said, and I'm grateful now that we're taking an, a more robust view in, in granting the exemption and, I am, and in terms of the capacity to quarantine. Um, suddenly we're hearing now that uh, persons may have to pay for their quarantine, but we'll leave with all of that. Let us get our citizens as quickly as we can home, appreciating full well that each and every one must go through quarantine. Can Trinidad and Tobago's diplomatic issues, the diplomatic issues that we face right now, may that hover over our efforts to get these nationals home, do you think? Absolutely. Look, I mean, I just this morning saw a release on the Barbadian government where they have coordinated um, through their diplomatic efforts the return of their citizens to Barbados. And then in an article yesterday, Grenada is receiving citizens on the very flight from the United Kingdom because they took the, 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 the position that they should reach out to the, the British um, government and to coordinate those things. I can't understand why it is we in Trinidad and Tobago, we speak of patriotism. This is an act to help our citizens of the highest level of patriotism. And it does not take much. It is the power of the pen. A simple request, one page, few lines, and the stroke of a minister's signature. What communication have you had with the government, and when was the last time you got relay from the government? Because this letter that I'm reading uh, is dated June 3rd. Yes, and that is, that is the latest one. That is yesterday's letter. But I, since last week I had written, and there's no, from that ministry, there seems to be a black hole. No communication whatsoever. And in fact, that is why I took the liberty of copying this latest letter to the Prime Minister, the Attorney General, who I must say has been 
trying to help um, as best as he could. The Minister of Health um, was indicated that space is ready and available for those persons to return. So all it takes is some effort from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yeah, uh, because the exemption has already been granted uh, yes. late yes. May, at the end of May, uh, to be exact. I, and I just the wanna... plane has been chartered already. Just awaiting that final approval that they indicate they require the authority of the Venezuelan government that requires um, a request from our government. Right. Over the next few months, I expect that we will have scores, if not it goes into the hundreds, of uh, exemptions not only being requested but perhaps also being granted over the next few months as Trinidad and Tobago reopens its phases as well. Have you, as both an attorney and a member of parliament, uh, been in contact with any more than just the Venezuela uh, nationals because as you mentioned yourself we have those in India we have people across Europe we've got people across the Americas as well yeah indeed we have many many persons who on a daily basis reach out to me and when you hear their personal circumstances it is heartbreaking and we make efforts on their behalf um, guiding them through the process to make their application for exemption and indeed as a, an attorney too I have sent letters um, completely free of charge of course um, to assist them in that process. So I look forward to the government taking the view that our citizens are not children of a lesser God because they don't happen to be here on an artificial day, 22nd of March, to be outside of our shores. They have a right to be here. Each citizen has the right, as every other one of us, including myself as a member of parliament and certainly as the Minister of National Security. Having said that, I appreciate that COVID is a dread thing, but we have the protocol necessary. We had the bed space um, um, that seems to be evaporating now um, to bring them on a cycle position. I wrote um, on that issue a long time ago, indicating a plan as to creating lists of priorities. Those who have medical concerns, I can tell you there are persons who are literally dying for lack of medical care in foreign countries. The, for instance, cancer treatment in one country is 5,000 pounds for one session. Surgery is 85,000 pounds. So you know, and we have pretty good um, um, treatments here that they wish to return home for that treatment. So it is really mind-boggling the, the lack of sensitivity in some persons in our government. Can I ask to, you to, to respond to the front page of today's Trinidad and Tobago Guardian newspaper, where the Minister of Health, Terence Dialsing, said that he will be talking to the Prime Minister regarding the possibility of having the mandatory COVID-19 patients uh, or at least I should say those in who will have to do mandatory quarantine uh, pay a fee for that quarantine. Jamaica is doing it. Should Trinidad and Tobago do it? Well, I tell you, Trinidad and Tobago, um, we have been very fortunate because we have been told that in the parallel healthcare system, we have developed 1,000 beds. It could be less, and we appreciate that there will be different stages, those who are ill, those who are not, those who are symptomatic, those who are asymptomatic, step down facilities and so. So I appreciate the numbers could be far less, but in terms of the they're charging um, a, a fee now for persons to be mandatorily quarantined. This is not their request. I think it will be a bit a bitter pill to swallow after having suffered for these months outside. Having said that, however, I know of persons who are begging, look, if you let me home, I will pay for my quarantine. They've actually told me that. So that is something for those who can afford it. Remember, there are different qualities, different levels, different requirements of certain persons. There's one person I'm dealing with. Um, a very prominent lawyer who wishes to return, you know, he's very, very ill, and he requires a bat, a bathtub for part of his treatment. And he has told me, look, if he has to pay, just he wants to come home and do it. So there are a, a wide spectrum of possibilities here, but I do not believe it is a proper approach where we have, um, if, if I'm to be corrected, Cascadia is one example where the government has paid for a large portion of that, and only two persons were occupying it for, for weeks. So no one come now to suggest that you're running out of money or things are getting um, tight. When we had the capacity, and we still do, as you re referenced, the racket center, a million dollars to accommodate the 33 from Barbados and um, many other places. So, you know, we really do need to understand what is happening here. I know the very difficult task that the Minister of Health has to endure, and, um, and I appreciate his efforts, um, but we need to have clarity and transparency as to how the money has been spent, what is now available to our citizens. At the end of it, it is to the citizens the benefit must come, and to suggest that they have to pay, and if they can't pay, what are you going to receive?
refuse exemptions on the basis that they refuse or have the inability to pay for quarantine, I find that nauseating. All right, uh, Mr. Ahmed, I also just want to ask you, as I have you over the phone, Parliament is said to be dissolved within the next month, uh, heading towards the general elections uh, for 2020. Can you talk to us about your own screening process and your own political affiliations? Well, let me just say, I have, I have not finalized my decision as to what I will be doing. As soon as I do that, I'll make it very public. Um, what, what, are you, what is your thinking with the current political landscape then, heading into the general elections for 2020? This country is in crisis in more ways than one. We have an economic meltdown. We have COVID, of course, contributing enormously to that. But we have a crisis in the politics where the quality of political debate has descended, not just recently, but for some time now, into acrimony. And, uh, and there's a sense of anger and divisiveness that has seeped in in the worst possible way. And this country, to face its crisis going forward, will require all of our good citizens who care about this country's future to work together. And that is not just empty words. We have the enormity of global climate change upon us. And of course, we've seen our foundation for, of the oil and gas economy shattered. And therefore, we need new thinking, the best minds coming forward into the politics, because politics is about power. And I wrote recently on the issue of power must be used as a tool and not as a weapon. We need all of us who can contribute the best tools to fixing this country to occupy positions of authority. What is going into your thinking in your choice? In my choice? Yeah. I want to see um, any group of persons being led with a vision for the betterment of every citizen of this country and not for their own uh, personal gain. I want to see leadership in a country that is forward, think forward thinking with science as its basis, with a very logical, practical approach, step by step with a blueprint as to how we're going to move on one um, negative position to a positive one. Are you, are you feeling under pressure time, to make will, a decision? I beg your pardon, sorry. Yes? Are you, uh, when can we expect a decision from you? I know that you said that you're thinking about it, and as soon as you come to a decision that you will release that to the public. Uh, how far from now do you think? Because the general elections is on the horizon. Yes. Well, as you pointed out, when Parliament is dissolved and election date is announced, I too will make my announcement. All right, let me also ask you about the bail amendment bill. Uh, sure, the, thank you for that. Uh, Attorney General Faris al Rawi called out the government, the, the opposition rather, saying that the bail amendment bill is in the hands of the opposition to bring it back to parliament and have it. Now, over the last week, the commissioner of police also weighing in on this bail amendment bill and calling for it. Is the opposition in any form or fashion ready to bring this bill back? There are so many calls and it's different when it comes from the commissioner of police, the head of the police service in this country. But I truly thank you for this opportunity because uh, I think the Commissioner of Police singled me out. Correct. Um, for an, a, a portion to, to me words I never spoke and, and um, positions I have never held that I wish, like others, to have persons who are charged with the possession of assault weapon to be granted bail. Nothing could be further from the truth. I think the issue here is about the quality of the judiciary making those decisions. And the country has to decide whether we're going to take away the discretion of a court or the right of a court to arbitrate between the rights of the citizens and the state. In the present law, under Section 11, under the Bail Act, if any officer or the prosecution is unhappy with the grant of bail, they can go to the High Court to have that bail revoked. And if they are unhappy with that decision of the High Court, they can go to the Court of Appeal. So it is not that the police or the prosecution doesn't have an option when they are unhappy with the grant of bail. They have that already in the law for years under Section 11. What has been requested now is removal of the right to access. So if a person without a previous conviction or pending matter is charged for the possession of a firearm, they will have to wait 120 days in prison before they can apply for bail. Are we to suggest that every person in this country who is charged for possession of a firearm is guilty of an offense and therefore should be penalized up front by three months penalty? I think the issue, and I've spoken to the commissioner and we continue to have an excellent relationship, the real, the real issue here is about speeding up the trial for gun, for gun offenses so that um, 
if a magistrate or a court decides that they should grant bail, well then, they don't have a very short timeline. And the problem, as speaking as a former minister, has always been obtaining the forensic report, because in every firearm case, we need a certificate indicating that the item is indeed a firearm before they can start. That has been a problem. We have started these few, uh, the efforts of obtaining forensic reports from certified uh, labs, foreign labs, and I think we must pursue that until we build the capacity locally to have those reports in a matter of days, or at most a couple of weeks rather than years in some cases. So when we have that, and if the judiciary can accommodate a specialized court so that all these firearm offenses can be given priority so that the guilty are convicted and the innocent acquitted. And I repeat, those who are convicted of those offenses must meet, must be met with a very severe um, penalty um, in accordance with the severity of having those weapons, I wouldn't say mass destruction, but terrible destruction, grenades and so. So that is really the issue about speeding up the justice system so the innocent are acquitted and the guilty convicted and penalized. Mr. So Prakash when, Ramada. When, when we deal with the issue of bail, bail is a, a, a right to each and every one. And if we are to continue to believe that it is a presumption of innocence, then we have to be very careful. There's an argument, of course, that the People's Partnership, of which was, I was a member, had passed similar legislation. There were two big differences with that. In, in that law, you needed to have a conviction or pending matter, and there was a sunset clause included in it. Um, so, you know, it's apples and oranges as we speak. And there is an alternative. There is an option under the present law to have bill revoked if you're unhappy with it. All right, Mr. Prakash Ramadan, we'll leave it there for now, uh, but we will welcome you back to the show once you make your decision and once there is an update with East Venezuela, uh, with our Trinidad and Tobago nationals in Venezuela as well. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Prakash Ramada, MP for St. Augustine, talking to us, and also attorney at law representing the nationals uh, who are stuck in Venezuela and hoping to make their ways back to Trinidad and Tobago. But the airspace first in Venezuela needs to be open. We're going to take a quick break here on the morning, Bruce. Still to come, phase three of the reopening process has begun. Hundreds of thousands of public servants back out. It's not sitting well with the PSA president, though. We'll talk to him a little bit later in the show. And we'll also tell you how you can stay in touch with us after this.